Good morning, Central families. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Sunday morning to worship. This weekend, this earthly plane had to say goodbye to two great American heroes, Representative John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. Both were phenomenal humans in their pursuit of equality for all and have had many connections with the folks here at Central. I've had the privilege, though I was unaware of it, to know John Lewis and to hear him speak at a Montreal conference in my teen years. I wish that I had the understanding of what I have now so that I can appreciate and resonate with his words then. With times like this, we can feel the sorrow and we can mourn the passing of two great individuals. As well, let us bask in their glory, for they have fought the good fight and they have ran this race with perseverance. Our prayers and thoughts are with their families, but let's not stop there. They left a great legacy, a torch to carry on. Their work is not done, and though their time with us have come to pass, their teachings, their work, their mission is all on us to continue. Thank you, Representative John Lewis, and thank you, C.T. Vivian. You may rest now. You earned it. And may you find peace. Dear Central Presbyterian Church, for the past few weeks, this nation has experienced a powerful and so needed civil unrest. The peaceful protests that have flooded the streets across the nation have demonstrated that this land continues to fail to provide the same kind of justice and equality to all people, especially to people of color. Unfortunately, we still live in an era in which certain people believe that some lives matter more than others. And this selfish imaginary differentiation continues to sustain a system of injustice and abuse. But throughout the history of this country and even during our current time, Many of us have witnessed the unprecedented change that courageous, faithful leaders have done in order to create a better world, a better nation, especially for those who have lived oppressed and under the margins of society. Last Friday, this nation lost two great heroes of the civil rights movement. First, we remember and give thanks for the life of the Reverend C.T. Vivian. He was an early civil rights organizer and field general for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference. His faithful leadership in nonviolent protests exemplified his vision of, quote, nonviolence is the only honorable way of dealing with social change, because if we are wrong, nobody gets hurt but us, end quote. We also remember and give thanks for the life of Representative John Lewis. John Lewis was more than a key figure in the civil rights movement. He was also a beloved Georgia congressman, a visionary political force, an ally for marginalized communities nationwide, and a dear friend to many of us here at Central Presbyterian Church. John Lewis' life was exceptional extraordinary. His devotion for creating a place where all people are treated with the same dignity and respect is a legacy that each and every one of us must follow. In his own words, according to his 2017 memoir, John Lewis writes, Freedom is not a state. It is an act. It is not some enchanted garden parched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is a continuous action we all must take, and each generation must do its part to create an even more just society. We remember and give thanks for their lives, for the ways they showed us God's love for this broken world, and for the faithful work bringing God's kingdom to this earth. For them, beloved church, 
we light a candle, we light a light, we remember and give thanks, and we say, to God be the glory, now and forever.
Good morning and welcome to worship with Central Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Jessica Patchett, one of the pastors on staff, and I'm so delighted that you have joined us this morning. In this hour, we will sing and pray and listen to words of ancient scripture and consider how God is speaking to us today for our lives of faith. And we hope that you will find in this community a sense of connection, of hope, possibility as we journey together through these days. And so I hope that you will leave your name and a little bit about yourself in the chat box, whether you're joining on Facebook or YouTube. If you're visiting with us on our website, perhaps scroll over to the staff page after the service and send us a note and let us know that you are here. It's a joy to be able to know and call each other by name. As we continue our time of worship, I invite you to join me in our opening sentences. Rejoice in God, for it is good to sing a song of thanks to God. Sing to God a new song, for God's word is right and God's loving kindness is sure. What a joy it is to worship God together. Knowing that the Spirit of God unites us, let us offer our praise and thanksgiving to our divine sustainer. The psalmist in Psalm 116 invites us to lift the cup of our salvation and call on the name of the Lord and to fulfill the vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. With that sentiment, central friends, let us now pray together. God, creator of all life around us, we glimpse at your beauty through the warm sunset, through the flowers that bloom in our backyards, and through the laughter that we hear in phone calls and at home. We glimpse at your power through the evening storm through the whispers of the wind and through the strength that people show as they faithfully care for one another. Gather us in your holy presence and plant in us courage to serve you and love you above all powers and things. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As God's beloved people, we are called to live a life that shows God's love to the whole world. Yes, to all creation and all people. But we are not perfect. And even when we try our very best, we have days in which we fall short of who we are meant to be as God's beloved people. Therefore, in faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. First, in a moment of silent confession. Now together we pray. Merciful God, 
We are flawed human beings. We confess that we have sinned against you and one another in thought, word, and deed. We have failed to live a life that is grounded on your love, your faithfulness, and your generosity. Our inner desires have manipulated our calling, and so we have broken our promises. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall become. Help us to delight in your wisdom and your will and to walk in your ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel that by the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven people. We have been given a second chance. Therefore, be at peace and seek righteousness. Alleluia. Amen. And now, as redeemed people filled with joy and forgiveness, let us now share this good news with one another. Whether you send a quick text message or leave a comment here on social media, or perhaps even a phone call following the worship service, tell the world, tell everyone you know, may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Morning, friends, and thank you for joining us. In our scripture reading today, we are going to hear from Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to read just a little bit so that we can talk about it. All right, join me, please. So this is coming from the CEB version, and it reads like this. Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourself with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make a effort to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit, just as God called you into one hope. There is one God, one faith, one baptism, and one God and parent of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So, one of the major things this says is that we received a call to be worthy from God. And we should act as if we have humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, have any of your family members told you that, hey, you should probably have a little more patience, or be gentle with your sibling, or maybe we should act with a little more humility. What does this life look like? Now, if you can take some time to just talk with your family unit or people that you are worshiping with to discuss what the world would look like if everyone was to act with humility, gentleness, and patience. Okay. Interesting. One of the things that when I started thinking about if everyone, including us, were to live with more humility, more gentleness, and more patience, 
I would see the world to truly be how God intended it to be. Like when we say in the Lord's prayers, thy will be done. Like, isn't this kind of what God wants us to do? So when we go out for this week, remember and try your hardest to account for times where you can be more humble, you can be more gentle, and you have more patience. I would love to hear how you saw that in yourself this week. Please join me in singing Psalm 1. I will sing the refrain first, and then I will invite you to sing with me. And each time the refrain comes in. Listen for and hear the word of the Lord. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's listen now for words of ancient wisdom as they come to us through Ephesians 4. I therefore, a prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, to equip the saints, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, 
promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, Paul says. There's so much calling to us in these days. The open road and a maskless beach, for some. A family reunion, where grandparents and grandchildren can play without the wild card of infection. A day when we could walk freely into a sporting event without having to be scanned for guns and a fever. A day when we are no longer threats to each other. We long for a day when we are no longer threats to each other. <laughs> what a day that will be. The Apostle Paul said that this, in fact, was the very nature and content of salvation. What calls to us about God's invitation to experience salvation made real in Jesus, but also in our lives. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul wrote that God's will in Jesus Christ, God's plan for the fullness of time, was to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, all things. In Jesus' life and ministry, God demolished the dividing wall. That is the reason for hostility between people and between people and God that we would no longer be strangers and aliens from each other, but citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In Jesus, God called people to receive this as a gift and to join their lives with his, to grow into a dwelling place for God, to become integral parts of a healing movement. Paul uses a very particular word to describe all of this. Paul says that God gave gifts to equip the saints, the people of God. And the Greek word that equip represents is actually in some cases a medical term used for when people set bones, uh, the creating of conditions under which two things that have been broken might be put back together and in working order. Throughout his letter, Paul uses this kind of growing together language to describe the call to which God calls people. He says, Jesus is a cornerstone, and God called you to grow together with him into a temple, a dwelling place for God. Jesus is the head, Paul says, and God called you to grow together as a body, given to serve the world. And that might sound really lovely for some people, for people who are idyllically happy with all the people in their church or their small groups or their families who um, might see a salvation such as this as getting to hang out with all the people I like who do all the same things I do and like all the same things I like. But Paul says that this vision of salvation is not just for some, for those who are already in groups or in a church they like, but for all people, for all people in heaven and on earth that all would be equipped together given the gifts they need to be knit together closely, as closely as the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone. It's bold. Every day around the world, <laughs> lizards regenerate tails, and spiders regrow legs, and starfish arms. But how often do we see human beings who have been torn apart join back together as if in a cast, to allow God's spirit to break down the hostility between them so that they can walk in lockstep together for good for the world. This, this vision is salvation. This vision is God's call to us that we might no longer live as threats to one another, but be joined together for mutual healing. It's relational, this kind of salvation not moral, not philosophical. Paul's five marks of this call, the experience of God's salvation, they're all relational. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Live a life worthy of the call to which you have been called, Paul says, begged, implored, called out to the Christians in Ephesus and to us today. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. 
1940, Coventry, England was almost entirely destroyed by German bombing. One of the ruined buildings was the old cathedral in the town center. A few walls stood, altar pieces remained, though they were charred. But windows and roof, they were gone. And it was no longer a sanctuary that could offer safety and security from a dangerous world. Its worshipers were left exposed and vulnerable to the violence and hostility that ravaged the earth. The charred cathedral remains stood there through the war, but in the 1950s when things were calmer, the diocese decided it was time to make plans to build a new church. Stephen Verney, the diocesan missioner, took an interesting approach to this. He could have gathered architects and patrons, people who could envision and underwrite the total reconstruction of the building they had lost and asked them, how do you rebuild this? Let's do it. But instead, he met with local church leaders in small groups around one question. What is the Spirit saying to the church? They prayed, they studied scripture, they sat in silence, they reflected together all around this one question, what is the Spirit saying to the church? Or in Paul's words, what is God's call to us? And ultimately, what they heard had very little to do with the architecture of bricks and mortar, but everything to do with how God calls us to build on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. They heard the Spirit say, leave the ruins as they are. On the burnt communion table, they set a cross in front of the words that the priest had carved, Father, forgive. Forgive what the enemy had done to the church. Forgive what those people did to our town. Forgive what they did to our children. Forgive what they took from us. Forgive us for the hostility in our hearts. Tear down the walls between us. Forgive. And help your people grow back into one. A healing body set to work for the healing of the world. The church leaders took what resources they had and they built a new ministry, one of reconciliation and mending and regeneration. They invited youth from Germany to visit Coventry and they sent youth from England to visit Germany so that the children of these warring nations would no longer be enemies and strangers, but would grow up into one body into maturity with Christ as the head, one household with Christ as the cornerstone. What is the Spirit saying to the church? Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Receive the gifts of God for mending and healing and joining. Enjoy the fullness of what Christ has to offer. The journey of receiving God's salvation of being gathered into God's people and being equipped or set together with others into working order. It's a lifelong spiritual journey. It's not completed by having church membership or reading or singing an appropriate canon or even by moving through the world alone, doing good deeds. None of these things are bad or wrong, but they're not the fullness of God's vision for us. Paul begs us for our own good and delight to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called, to grow up in every way, joined and knit together by every ligament with which we are equipped, every connection that we have, that we might have the deep privilege of being part of God's salvation, of God's gathering in of the whole world, all things on earth and in heaven. There are so many things that call out to us in these days. Escape from the constant fear of infection. A day without having to give presentations on Zoom with one hand while potty training a toddler with the other. <laughs> a haircut, for goodness sake. These things call out to us. But the spirit calls too. And sometimes it's in the quiet 
of the night as whispers to our souls. Sometimes that call comes from the street, from hospital rooms, from polling places, from banks, from food pantries, from neighborhood associations, from schools, from phone calls from loved ones. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. For in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of God so that we who are the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. And so I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may come to know God so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know the hope to which God has called you. What are the riches of God's glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for those of us who believe? I pray all these things and more for you this day. Amen. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a Beloved Church, we believe that the practice of communal prayer shapes us as disciples. It gives us strength and wisdom for living these uneasy days. Prayer reminds us of the eternal promise that we are never truly alone. And it is a very real way in which we can care for one another. We invite you to share your joys and concerns here in the comment section below. In doing so, we commit ourselves to holding faith together as a community. This morning, we want to give thanks to God and we rejoice in welcoming two new team members here at Central Presbyterian Church. First, we welcome Rokaya Strozier as the new executive assistant. And we also welcome Dave Wooten as our new business manager. He will begin his ministry here at Central next Monday, July 27th. 
We give thanks to God for their lives and their excitement that they, for the work that is happening here at Central Presbyterian Church. Now, let us join one another as we go to God in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we are people of the resurrection, called by name and redeemed by your grace. Yet we are exhausted by the uncertainty and uneasiness of today. We keep encountering sickness all around us and the valley of shadows and death is becoming wider, deeper, drawing us into anxiety and despair. But even when we feel like that, we know that you are here with us, God of eternal life. May your light break through the locked doors of our hearts and our homes. Bring us hope and assurance. Enliven our faith and comfort our souls. This morning we unite our voices praying for all of us who continue to live under quarantine or shelter in place. For those who are sharing spaces and struggling to get along. For those whose space is quiet and feel a deep longing for the embrace of one another. For those who do not have a place for resting and struggle to find support. For those who are working on teams and getting on each other's nerves. For those who are not working at all and are struggling to get their needs met. For those whose homes are filled with a bit of messiness and a bit of noise due to children and for the children who struggle to find activities and fun things to do at home. God, fill these spaces with your presence. God, we pray for all of those who are sick in body, mind and spirit. Transform and heal your world, God of wonders and miracles. Wherever we are sheltered, in homes and hospitals, in apartments and under highway bypasses, in hotels and in hostels. Shelter your people in your arms and heal them with your touch. Be with those who have lost a loved one. Comfort them and give them peace, we pray. We also pray for your guidance and your protection for all those working to heal our world for the first responders, the medical and health care workers, the teachers and the grocery store clerks, the chaplains and the construction workers, the ones that work for justice and march in your light, for the hope proclaimers and the grief counselors, for the friendly neighbors and the policy makers, for the ones who provide warm meals and give generously from the blessings that they have. For those we love and for those who no one seems to love. In your holy name, O oh God, we offer our prayers and unite our voices. And we proclaim the truth that your son Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, please come, costly cross.
Friends, we have been called by God, we have been ordained by God, and we have been loved by God to be worthy. From the beginning of time to the end of time, this truth does not change. And so I leave you with this. May the peace of God be with you, and may the love of God be with you. As well, may you give the peace of God to others, and may you show the love of God to others. Amen.